I'm trying to cover your four points, Cliff. Are you so dense that you can't see that? A skeptic is someone who questions, but to be a cynic is horrendous. And Matt, you have just displayed tremendous cynicism. Why thought, are you so upset, Cliff? It's a simple question. Yes, archaeology verifies the New Testament. These Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are historically reliable. You have a failed methodology. That was the point. None of us has exhaustive knowledge in any area of life. We as human beings cannot prove anything. You need to clean up your thinking. No, you need to straighten out your thinking and think more logically. Whenever I read an historical book, I have four tests that I use to determine historical reliability. The first test is literary style. Is it once upon a time in the land of Nod, wink and blink and the Nod took a boat ride? Or is it at this time, in this place, with these people around, Jesus said this and did that? The second test is, what is the manuscript evidence? And the manuscript evidence for the New Testament is overwhelmingly clear that we have an accurate presentation of what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote. Doesn't mean it's the truth, but we have an accurate representation of what they wrote. Third test, archaeology. Does archaeology support and verify the place names, the names of the rulers like Pontius Pilate, Herod Agrippa? Yes, archaeology verifies the New Testament, like the Pool of Siloam in the Gospel of John. And then fourth test is, are there contradictions within the text that point to massive confusion on the part of the authors? No, there are no contradictions in the Gospels. There's a tremendous internal harmony and consistency. That does not mean the Bible's a word of God. It doesn't mean anything other than these Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are historically reliable. Simply read them as history and ask yourself, does the historical evidence point to Christ being credible or does it not? Okay, so um, first of all, I, I'm glad that we have four crisp criteria by which you're going to evaluate historical texts. Um, whether or not something fits in a historical text, I'm assuming is just that it's old. You know, it's something we can't go back and investigate because we don't have a time machine. So it's a, a text about a period of time. So the first one you look at is the literary style. Once upon a time, uh, those sorts of things to see what kind of style is. When I look at the Bible, um, I, like many Christians, uh, have a difficult time taking Genesis as a literal account. It is factually uh, incompatible in its order of events with what we know from the scientific investigation of order. It is absolutely storybook wise about uh, a, a, a fall and a talking serpent who leads someone astray and leads somebody else astray. Uh, I find the character of God to be comical um, throughout, at least throughout the Old Testament, of constantly trying to get humanity to to love him and and do right, and he has to keep starting over. He puts him in the garden; it fails. He kicks him out of the garden. He then has to confuse everybody's languages and flood the whole earth, except for a handful of people, to start over again. And then he has to select his chosen people from all of the various peoples after starting over again. And then he takes a big long vacation until he supposedly comes down in human form. I find that to be more char characteristic of mythicism and, and, and storytelling in the literary style example. It does the the miraculous claims, the things that uh, raising people from the dead and walking on water and turning water to wine um, of demons and all these other things. These things to me read more like a storybook. Doesn't mean they're not true, but they read more like a storybook. Your second one of manuscript evidence that leads you to conclude that we have an accurate presentation of what the author said is irrelevant to the truth. We can, I could just say, hey, we have 100% accuracy on what the author said, and that doesn't in any way tell us whether or not it's true, which even you acknowledge when going through the criteria. On archaeology, you're like, does archaeology support things with like the place names? Well, first of all, I don't find it remotely surprising that books written in a certain time period and in a certain area might reference real places and real events. We do that in our fiction all the time. And most other stories that you might not accept as true from other religions 
also support place names, but there isn't archaeological evidence to support a resurrection. There isn't archaeological evidence to support the sun standing still. There isn't archaeological evidence to, port to support a global flood. There isn't archaeological evidence of demons or any of the things like that. And then the last one is a, is a, is a really intriguing one about contradictions. And we can have a discussion sometime about whether or not there are contradictions. Trying to reconcile the Easter accounts is something that I haven't been able to, I haven't seen anybody successfully recount who was there, when, what happened, when, and in what order, um, de depending on which of the gospels you go to for that particular narrative, there's a different order of events and different people involved. And what tends to happen is that apologists say, yes, the specifics may be wrong because you have different people telling the story, or they might be viewed from a different perspective, but it tells the consistent narrative and therefore there's no contradictions. But here's a question. Is it possible for a story to have no contradictions and still not be true? That's why I asked you to take all four tests together. Now, Maggie, no, no, sir. No, job no, sir, please. Stepping into a, tr a classic. I, 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 I asked a question. I, I have yeah, more questions. I already answered your question. No, now, sir, you, you didn't. You replied yes, with did. that's why no, my, I had to look at all four. Problem, why problem. are you so upset, Cliff? It's a simple question. Because you're cutting me Is off. It, is yeah, it possible? Off, is it possible? Sorry, I let you speak. Now you won't let me speak. Is it? I'm, I'm. I'm. I'm still going. Is it possible for there to be no contradictions and the story still not be true? Yes. Yes. Right. Is it possible? Yes, it is. For, possible. Is it? Hang on. Is it possible for there to be manuscript evidence that the authors were correct? Uh, our authors are being accurately reported, and yet their claims are still not true. You already said that, yes to that, when you were there. Yes. Is it possible for archaeological evidence to support place names, and yet the events still aren't true? Yes, that's called historical fiction. Sure. A is it possible? Style. Is it, it possible for you to look at a literary style? Come on, bud, let's be honest here. I'm trying to cover your four points, Cliff. Are you so dense that you can't see that? I'm going through your four points as a rebuttal to your position. It's possible. I'll just, I won't even ask the question. Here we go. It's possible for the, it, it's possible for there to be no contradictions and the story still not true. It's right. possible that archaeology archaeology could support place names and the story still not true. It's That's possible right. that the manuscripts could accurately reflect what the author said and the yep. author still not true. It is possible that the literary style could be misunderstood story wise or accurate and the story is still not true. So the four criteria that you gave for determining the accuracy of a historical text are incapable of doing that on their own. You have a failed methodology. That was the point. Then give me a better one. How do you test the historical reliability of any document? What are the tests? I don't need to give you a better one. I'm not here defending historical claims. Oh, baloney. If you're tearing my four points down, which you have every right to do, you had better give me a more intellectually acceptable no, sir. That's is, not that, the way. That's not the way any of this works. You presented a case. I now debunked it. Now you have right? to go back to the drawing the board. Honesty, and board. You Hold have on to come second. up with the Because just you are the to be one sure that who just can got hear exposed each, as I irrational. I do want to just jump in really quick before. I, so, quick heads up, folks, that we'll go into the Q and A shortly. By that I mean five to ten minutes tops. But I do want to let you guys continue, as I know you might have some final threads you want to draw together before we do go to the Q&A. Yeah, when, when your methodology gets debunked, it's not up to the opponent to present a methodology that would confirm the supernatural. I have no methodology that would confirm the, confirm the supernatural. Neither does anybody else. You presented your case for why you find these texts reliable. I exposed where the problem is. You don't then get to say, well, have you got a better one? Because that suggests that you're willing to stick with a flawed methodology until somebody comes along with a better one. It's not my job or anybody else's job to fix the foundation of your beliefs. That's your job. To be a skeptic is good. A skeptic is someone who questions. But to be a cynic is horrendous because cynicism gets us nowhere. And Matt, you have just displayed tremendous cynicism because what you've done is you've said, these are the problems with your methodology. And I agree with you. There are problems to my methodology. But Matt, none of us has exhaustive knowledge in any area of life. Okay. We as human beings cannot prove anything. Instead, we as thinking human beings take the evidence that we have and then make the most reasonable, the most plausible conclusions. 
So my point was simply the evidence is the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give us accurate historical information. My point was not that they're perfect. My point was not that there's without error. I never said that. Instead, I gave four pieces of evidence that I use whenever trying to determine whether any document is historically accurate or not. Now, the mistake that you're making, sir, is very clear. If I say that a interpretation that I have of the Quran is contradicted by science, in order to be intellectually honest, I have to go back and study, is my interpretation of the Quran correct? Because if my interpretation of the Quran is incorrect, then it is intellectually dishonest for me to say the Quran contradicts science. Similarly, if you have a wrong interpretation of the book of Genesis, and then you say science contradicts my interpretation of creation and of a serpent in a garden, but if your interpretation is incorrect, you're committing intellectual suicide because you are showing that science contradicts a false interpretation. Well, so what? I agree with you. The question is, what is an accurate interpretation of Genesis, and does science contradict that accurate interpretation of Genesis? And my point is rather simple. There is absolutely no science in Genesis to contradict. There's no biology, no zoology, no astronomy, no science anywhere in the Genesis account. That is why for anybody to say, oh, I can't believe Genesis because it contradicts science, is intellectually dishonest, because there's no science in Genesis for modern science or ancient science to contradict. It's that simple. Okay, so in Genesis, when it lists the order of events that it God created, supposedly, um, is that order accurate to the order that things were actually created? Augustine answers your question back in the 400s. I'm not debating he Augustine. Out, he points out, I'm using it as an illustration, Matt, so listen hard. Augustine points out that in light of the fact that the sun was not created till the fourth day, what on earth do the first three days mean if you don't have a sun? And Augustine's point was, Genesis is not seeking to answer the question, precisely how long did God take to create? I didn't say I about it. Augustine. I, I think did. an accurate interpretation of the text. Okay. When you tell me to listen carefully, it'd be really good if you did too. I didn't ask anything about how long it took. I asked about the order that it took. The order, the length, are not precisely given. Okay. So basically you're saying that the order of events in Genesis 1 not only does not match the order of events as we actually understand it from science, but doesn't match the order of events that a God would have, that God did create the events. No, I'm not saying that, Matt. What, what I am saying is Genesis does not answer the question. Genesis does not address the scientific question. There is no science in Genesis. Are we clear now, Matt? Well, there are claims about reality in Genesis, are there not? Yes, about God, about human beings, about the value of human beings. About God there creating? Are absolutely no scientific claims. Just think about who wrote Genesis. I, I, I appreciate the fact that you'd like for there. People sitting in their tents that. on the corner of the promised land. Do you honestly think Moses was concerned with a question? Gosh, what's the scientific process that God used to create? It was the furthest thing from his mind. They were scared out of their wits about it, going into the promised land. So this, this is a wonderful is, tap dance, but the the, is this is a wonderful tap dance. But Genesis no, an one interpretation. No, it's sir, it's a wonderful tap dance because you're avoiding the question, you're avoiding the actual events, and you're going off to talk about other things elsewhere. No, I'm My not. question is, yes, you were. You literally just did. Rewind. Everybody can hear it. You yeah, are not talking it. about, Rewind you it. are not talking about not Genesis chapter on, one, one sir. I'm asking you about Genesis chapter one, and you're going off to talk about other things in Genesis. In Genesis chapter one, when it gives the order of events, you're saying that order of events is not the way that God did it. No, I'm not. Okay. I never said are that. you saying? Let are you say saying? It again, then, Matt. So just so you get are a you saying? In Genesis are you chapter saying, one, there is are you no saying? Oh my God! It's so, one, one why is it? Just to, why is it? Let's, there. let's. This is absolutely frustrating. Well, let's, let's, are you saying? Over, uh, let's kick it very well, Matt. Are you but, saying? We, we, are you saying that the order of events is correct? No. I'm saying they no, don't. No, you're not. So you're not, not saying care about the order of events. I don't. That I don't care what point. you care about. I, I'm saying you seem to be the saying. The, you seem to be saying. You seem to be saying that the order of events is 
not correct? You're, you're not saying that it's not, not correct. Right, hang exactly. on, let me finish. You're not saying that it's not correct, and you're not saying that it is correct. I am saying, and I'll say it again for the umpteenth time, Genesis chapter 1 is not giving us a scientific description of how God created. Genesis chapter 1. I didn't one say it was. The question, I, I haven't said anything remotely like created. that. With Genesis 1. I haven't said anything remotely question, like that. What process did God use? I didn't ask about a process. I didn't ask about any of that. The fact that you have dishonestly refused to address your own contradiction here is very telling. All I asked about was the order of events and whether or not you were convinced that the order accurately reflected, reflected the order, not the process, not how, the, the, the order that things happen or not. And you, okay, that is very would, you would not say order that it's process for me. Order is part of the process. I'm sorry that I order is process for you, but that's not process. I didn't ask order. how I asked about order. I don't know why this is so difficult. I do know why I do know why, because fundamentally, you know, that this order doesn't match reality and you have no explanation for why the almighty God of the universe conveyed information about an order that does not match the facts of the universe. And you have a wrong interpretation of Genesis 1 and you're using science to contradict a wrong interpretation of Genesis 1 and that is very sad, Matt. You very, know what's sad? That you accuse sad. me of having a it's wrong like interpretation when I'm the only one that's willing to read it and talk about what it actually says. You're, I've read that, all the that time. is sad. That, you, you are the sad one to suggest that this is a problem of my interpretation when I'm literally asking you for your view. I but told you. This is the best tap dance not ever, Cliff. The question. Good Genesis job on that. One does not dance. answer the question. That's out fucking standing. Clean up your language, Matt. It's not a, I don't need to clean up my language at all, sir. You need to clean up your thinking. No, you need to straighten out your thinking and think more logically. This you look, fantasy okay. puts into illogic. Thank you. This might be a good opportunity to go into the Q&A. We do have a lot of questions. We're going to move through these fast.